Commercial production of fish is profitable, but it must be properly planned and managed. One of the ways devised by this fish farm, known to have successfully produced catfish for profit for many years, is court farming. The farmers share resources, knowledge, benefits, and sometimes share the burden. Festus and his wife have been in the business long enough to know their way around. They chose fisheries after studying accounting and business administration at tertiary levels. Uh -huh, my twin brother, he studied agri. So he was the one that introduced me into the uh, fish business. So immediately I left the school, I came into the business. Myself and my wife, we came so into the business. business. Uh, if you say that. <laughs> <laughs> so both of us are into the business for oh, barely 14 years now, no more than there about. It's a good business. I would say it's a very lucrative business. You understand? Because uh, if I said I should be working when I left school, I don't think I will be where I am now. So since I came here, it has been a very good business for myself and my wife. According to the farm rules, a person is supposed to have three pounds to his um, it's him or herself, but you can have more. You buy over, have to eat, or you can rent. You are allowed to do that. Then, day activities like maybe having workers, feeding, other kind of stuff, fine. And uh, the days of six is Monday and Thursday. That's the major six day. But any other day, we can still sell fish, but not as much as like uh, Monday and Thursdays. And um, the price of the fish, it varies by sizes. We have what we call big and medium. They are the same price. Then we have small and we have smallest. So we're talking about big and medium. Now today is uh, 1,400 per kilo for the big and medium. Then the small one is one two fifty to one three hundred. That's the wholesale price. Wholesale, uh, wholesale. Then the smallest one thousand two hundred. Then we have other one we call market to mass sizes, like one thousand two hundred or one thousand one fifty thereabout. So normally we don't sell um, maybe one one kg. We sell in bulk, large quantities. That's how we sell in this one. We don't allow just anyone coming to come and buy one piece of fish. So we sell in large quantity. Because I wanted to buy, nobody is ready to sell. Yeah. Uh, maybe when you are, like we are selling fish you now, maybe you feel like buying one fish, um, we can decide to sell one piece of fish for you, the permission of our <laughs> leaders. <laughs> okay, you can sell one piece of fish for them. Since I left school, I don't think I've ever worked for somebody. Uh, I've been working for myself, myself and my wife will be into this business and it has been very, very, very good and lucrative. We'll be enjoying the business. Mm -hmm. It farm villages, uh, I would say 100% different from other farm villages. One, there's a kind of a cooperation we have in this place and uh, we have a good leader in the, in the good leader like um, Mr. Marcos who is the one coordinating the farm, at least I've been you know, coordinating the farm very well. And uh, you see, in fact, people will tell you that ah, anyway, farm fishes are different because one, we don't feed the fish with anyhow feed. So we have regulated feed, feed, to feed our fish in this place. You are not allowed to feed with dead animals. In fact, we don't even feed with maggot we don't, because we're not trained like that. So when we talk about the farm, village is 100 percent different from other farm cluster they love the communal setting and believe it is why everywhere remains a place where fish farming thrives his brother was serving around this farm i was in olabisa on obanjo so he now said i should come down to this place and see what they are doing here so and i came when i came i saw the fish for the first time in my life saw the farm so i look at it i never believed that they can do something like this that they can be rearing fish in something like that. I've never seen something like that before. 
So immediately I saw it, I went back to school. That is how I have the interest that at the end I will do something like, like this. You studied agriculture? I studied accounting. I was thinking of working in a bank, putting on a nice suit, getting my money every time, but the dream changed. So when I, based on the interest I have towards it, actually. So when I got to this place, there are some courses I have to do after my BSc that I did not do. I used the money to serve, start the fish then. And any regrets so far? I no regrets so far because the first one I did, I was able to make a lot of money. And from there, I'll be making money. And when you talk about the organization where I met myself, we have a nice, we are, they group us in a cooperative society. When I first started, we are in a cooperative society that even say you, the money you have there is not enough. You collect loan to substitute what you have. Uh, we don't have issue. When it's time for us to sell, we have people that will come to the farm to come and buy. And if there's any, any need for any information, maybe there's something that we are doing that is not right, there's training, we have people that will easily call that will put us through. Uh, when you talk about this farm, we are talking about unity. Let me tell you something. If another farm, uh, someone is selling, that we are not in the same group, I can go to that person and pick from the field that that person is selling. That is showing the unity that we have within ourselves. I can go to another group entirely. When I reach that group, I tell them you are the one selling. Okay, we believe that everywhere farm, we are one, one family, that we are just one big family, that we relate with each other. When we see uh, when we even meet outside, so we still relate the way we relate here. We don't have issue with anybody. And the way we manage, our, we, we have our own worker, we buy our fuel, all the things that is needed, we have them provided, we provide them, we put them in a place that they can get access to it. And when you are talking about management, we have worker. But in order for us to, you know, I told them I'm a management student, in order for you to achieve a lot of things in what you are doing, you have to motivate your worker. You don't give them, you don't leave them to do all the job. When you motivate them, they'll be able to provide more service for you. So we work together. And what we do is that when they pull, when they come in the money, they pull for air, they pull feed. When they are feeding one pond, they are feeding one pond. Also, my husband feed the other pond. We work together in unity and we eat together. So it made the work to go smoothly. We are here to make profit. We are not here to showcase that I'm the one that have the biggest fish or that or that. And when I look at their feed, fish or feed also, I discover that their feed is okay. It's not that there's a good regulation based on what they are producing. And it's bringing out the necessary results I'm expected. So in that, I buy their feed. Now that the price of our own is very high, I go for that one in order for me to reduce costs. Formulated fish feeds are considered the most cost-effective way to provide a balanced nutrition for aquacultured fishes. These feeds are concentrated source of nutrition and has been one of the key contributing factors to increase fish production along with other elements of fish like water management and aeration. This is a pellet mill situated within the farm. The process here involves creating pelleted feeds by compression of raw materials, which is in powder form. The powder is poured into the machine and it comes out pelleted. With the finished product, it will be good to see how the fishes are fed. We just uh, to take the uh, uh, tea. Uh, 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 <laughs> <laughs> So is it that the owner of this pond is not ready to sell yet? Uh, yeah, there are different markets for all sizes of fish. There are different markets for the big sizes, for the small sizes also. Uh, like the ones we experienced over there, they are being bought majorly by market women who go to sell. You can't, they hardly sell this in the market in our, in our areas here. So, but there's a market for this. There are people who come around to buy this. So people 
can do eight months, nine months, ten months at quite big sizes. Do they have a measurement or the, um, uh, the amount of food uh, they're going to give at the time? So uh, because I can see that she keeps two yes. things at them. There, there are two types of feeding. You know, feeding at limitum till because if you observe their movement, once they get to pick whatever they are picking, they get to move. You would see that the population here is decongesting bit by bit. By the time she is almost through, all of them would have left, and that's a signal. However, also there is a means in which you just decide by calculating the number of fish you have there, their average weight, and you measure out, okay, I'm going to be feeding this pond particular kilograms of feed per day. So you measure out that feed, and then you feed them. So those are two ways, the controlled feeding and the ad libitum feeding. But as you can see, once they get what two or three pellets, they move and they are okay. They are already eight months in. I mean, how, how long more would you wait till you have best this? They look big. Yeah, they look big. That's why I said everything is a function of market. You know, there are some people that this is what they are interested in. Some people can come in to buy like 2,000 kilograms of this majorly in the southeast all of onicha enugu and all of that they they eat big sizes of fish over there so there's a market for this as it is there's a market for three months old fish there's a market for two months old fish even they are you know some tiny pieces of fish that they usually smoke mm. they form rings with them and they smoke them you know so so that's the, that's that's just it yeah. How many times do they get to do this in a day? Okay. Uh, it, it varies across uh, different factors, uh, but sometimes they do two. They feed them twice in a day. But at this stage, they might they can do well with once a day. So, are you here every day? Yes, I am. I come in the morning, 8, 8.30, then close between 4 and 5. Pumia Kinyemi is one of the many farmers at Eriwe. This is a nine to five. She speaks about how she keeps the fishes alive and the business afloat. On this, on this particular pond, yeah. what is going on here? Actually, we net the pond at the stage of fingerlings, juvenile, line, and when they are under two months, most of the time, to prevent, you know, anything attacking the fishes or picking them up, birds or animals or whatever. But when they have grown, they are over three, four months, you, you can remove the net and there's, they are okay, the size. So, but when they are small, they are exposed to birds and animals that can easily pick them up. So when are you going to remove stage. this one? Like this one, in the next one, we, we are going to take it off because they are up to four months now. And their sizes are big. There's no animal that can pick them or any bird that can take them from the water. So, uh, usually, do, do you know the, the number of fish you have in a pond at a time? Yes. How we do as farmers is that we collect a certain number of fingerlings. Sometimes they take juvenile. You count the number. You want 10,000 pieces. Like for this pond now, I got 10,000 pieces. But by the time it was two months, we saw them. There's what we call sorting. We saw them into the two ponds to give them room to swim and to be able to eat very well. So you, you do that within a space of two months. After two months, you can sort them out because they are quite sizable. So you can be able to pick out the shooters. Those are the ones that are bigger. You put them on one side. Then the ones that the size is about the same, you put them on the other side of the pond. So with that, with that sorting, you count the number of fingerlings that remain that you have sorted into the pond. So do you incur losses at this level and how do you manage that? Yes, actually that's one of our major challenges, the fingerlings issue. Because we tend to source from people raising fingerlings and we discover that most of them are not using matured blue stocks. Like initially I've done, I've been in it for about 10 years. Initially when you get the fingerlings you can raise within 6 months, 7 months you sell. The fish are quite sizable. But nowadays, we realize that most of the fingerlings that we get, they are not that of high quality. The blue stock they are using, that's supposed to be like five years fish that they will use to do their fingerlings, they are no longer using that. So most of the time, by the time you are sorting your fish after two months, 
you might not have up to the number that you put inside. So that's one of the major challenge. At the end of the day, you have a reduction in number, 8,000, 7,000. So how do you manage that, uh, uh, the pool? Would there be contamination of the water? What would happen? No. Most time it's because vingalins are not too, they are not of the highest quality. So they will tend to feed on each other. So it, it demands proper management. Like if you get your fingerlings now, like some other, one other side, we have some little ones there. Like I feed them three times a day. So that means you feed them in the morning, feed them in the afternoon, then in the evening to make sure the survival rate is high and they don't you know eat each other up. So by the time they are well fed, they will eat. They will not, you know. Because the survival feed on also the defines the profitability. So yes, and yes. Sense so if there's proper management and the finger, you can manage it well, and the brew stock is a little bit good. After ten thousand, you can have after the sorting, you can have like seven thousand. You have had to learn and unlearn the entire. Yes, process. what you think you have at the end of the day, you come back to managing less. But it's better because by the time you do two months, they are the ones that are surely to survive. They are the ones that will be left. So by the time you now start feeding those ones, you have an assurance that, okay, by the time I'm selling, this is the quantity of yeah. fish that is in my pond. Not at the initial stage when you first put in the 10,000. Okay. Then you say, okay, you can now conclude that's the amount you have in the sure. pond. Managing the pond can be quite a task. So, can you do this on your own, or you would always seek for help from time to time? Yes, you you can. If you say one pond, probably you can manage it on your own. But when you have two, five ponds, we need helps, and we have hired helps in on the farm that come in. We employ them to look after the pond, and what it means is that you are in charge and make sure you supervise what they are doing. Sometimes, most time, we don't tell them to feed. When they come in the morning, on the pumping machine to pump water for the fish, because they, they take water a lot. So before you come, you know the time you are feeding. So when you are there, you sit down with them, you feed the fish together. So those are what they do for us. Then when we want to, you know, remove the water, like after a while, the water gets bad, you need to flush, we call it flushing. So they will now remove the outlets and now flush the water. Then you, you are staying there, making sure. Then you want to know the size of the fish, how well they are doing. But then they flow, and we drain out all the water. Then we clean the pond. We pour water. Then sometimes you can do salt treatment. Just make sure they are all clean. Then you pump in fresh water. So you are there with them. So those are the work they do for us yeah, in yeah. the farm. You have been doing this uh, for a while and yes, were you convinced at the beginning that this is what you wanted to do or you've tried your hands on a few things before you... No, actually I've always had interest in fish farming because there was a time I was somewhere in the north and I put my hand into it. Even though it's not like I read that creek but I've had interest and in that environment we had a lot of fish farm there. So I was able to do about three or four times. So I had interest, I love the work so much. I've always wanted to go into fish farming. So by the time I came down and to this area, this community, I decided to make investigation. I found what they were doing here and I now joined in continuing what I've been doing before. Poor management, inadequate supply of good quality seed, lack of capital, high cost of feeds are among the challenges an average fish farmer faces. Sorry, sir. These mini pumping machines do the magic. They sit near every pond, furled and watered to kickstart and generate the required amount of pressure. We need to prep it. I'm also here to lend the ropes, and what better way to do it than being part of the process. Yeah, I'm 
Yes. Yes. So for how long? Uh, we we get people. We call them pond dressers. Oh, okay. They will dress the pond. And this was the bucket I was looking for. Fishing at Terry Wave Farm is an all-year-round business, but there are market days where the fish is harvested and sold. My name is Alex Abiola. The farm also attracts people from far and near. It also remains a place of research, hosting students, international organizations and government agencies. Since 2002, we have been having several communities, not only in Nigeria, even in, from East Africa, Ghana and all that, uh, uh, Uganda, uh, Malawi and all that. In fact, now you will see people from Malawi testifying that it was after they came here they be able to go back to their country and, um, and there is a kind of revolution in the aquaculture industry. Uh, several communities have been coming, but how successful they are, well, we continue to live for now. Uh, that's uh, uh, yeah, about several communities, nothing less than 70 of them have been coming around to, to try to replicate. Fish smoking can reduce post-harvest losses by a huge percentage and rapidly increase incomes for people depending entirely on the fishery sector for their livelihoods. Everywhere farmers had its fair share of setbacks. So now it, it is estimated that up to 35% of aquaculture production yeah. is either wasted or lost to, in, in different ways. But I want to assume that one of those ways will be flooding. Is yeah. that a problem around it? Yeah, we have a problem of flooding, or I would say we used to have a problem of flooding. Uh, we experienced flooding uh, 2021, 2022. Uh, in the past five years, I can say we have experienced flooding nothing less than three times. And whenever it happens, it's usually, a, it's usually disastrous. Uh, many people get to lose their fish and all of that. However, towards uh, meditating against that or mitigating the effects of, of the flooding, uh, we usually embark on the dredging of the river, uh, the dredging of the waterways to pave more, more way. And we have decided that we'll be doing that at least once in two years. Uh, it was done last year. Uh, it was done uh, last year. Yeah, it will still be done this year or next year. Flooding, funding, I feel of the challenges the farm faces. To bring youth in into this type of project, we need small funding because the gestational period, the youth cannot fund, they, cannot, they, have, they need something to live on until they start making pro profits. If you bring in, if for example, if you bring them into the youth, even if you give them all the implements, you still need to give them stipends for six months to nine months for them to start reaping. And uh, so we have been soliciting for funding both for interested uh, people that are really committed. So the number of youths we have is really very small. I think about uh, 20 to 30 now. But we believe that we can cope with hundreds if we really have funding. We do periodic review to look at our impacts, where, which areas we can also go into. It's a continuous development. And among us, we have professionals, we have professors, we have university lecturers, we have researchers. We, most of our, body, uh, our projects are research-based. We just don't jump into uh, this thing. We do, uh, just like the initial project was from, as a result of a research. There is a community research to determine the extent of poverty, uh, what is, was causing the poverty, and what solution can be applied. The, uh, the project, uh, the initiative came up. Also, we also require that each time we go back, when we are going to do a youth, we are still going to start our youth projects, we also do a, a lot of uh, research to find out who and who among the youth are really in poverty, what and what can we do, what are the areas of impact that will make specific impact. And that has been, uh, we are research-based and uh, development organization.
But against the odds, the handlers of Eriwe Fish Farm Village say the farm has consistently produced more than 2,000 metric tons of catfish yearly for the past four years and hope to scale up the number in the coming years. That's our show for today, everyone. Hope you enjoyed every bit of it. You can watch this episode and other episodes on our YouTube channel. You can also follow the conversation on our social media platforms displayed on the screen. Thank you very much for watching. I am Dari Do. See you next time and bye for now. Bye.